I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget J. Paul Valenza. I'm Thomas O'Neill White. I'm Angelie Preston. We need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is What's Next. A dedicated hour to have important conversations about the issues facing the marginalized and underrepresented communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. What's Next continues our mission to discuss race, equity, and the common concerns of Buffalo's East Side and beyond. In the suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. This is What's Next. Today we are joined by Bree Gilliam. She's a local visual artist here in Buffalo. Bree, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Happy to have you. So, okay, so one thing I, I kind of wanted to mention right away, uh, we, and we talked just a little bit about this off air, but so you're relatively recent grad at Buff State. You've been out for, um, it'll be two years, right? You graduated in yes. 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, you graduated with a BFA in painting, and you, and you, you just mentioned you had a, a minor in art therapy too, right? Yes. Um, but we, as we just kind of talked about, you, it's it's not like that was the culmination of you know years and years of painting. It was actually kind of a relatively recent thing. So I'm I'm pretty pretty fascinated by that. So what you said you had kind of done other kinds of painting before you began your sort of uh, education in painting. But what really led you to start working with uh, with oil paints? Because that's kind of what you're uh, known for now. Very bold, bold kind of bold colors, bold oil face paint. So what kind of what kind of led you to that? I'd, be, I'd love to kind of start there and we can go in a couple of places. Yeah. So um, in high school, I started with oil paint my last year, um, 2018. And um, I decided to go to college. I was a general art major. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do with art, um, but my professor, Professor um, Chang at Buffalo State College, he he saw he saw my skills and he said, you're working very quickly. You know, maybe you should be a painting major. And I was shocked and I was a little bit scared as well because I never worked in oil. <laughs> but um, I decided to just, you know, take a chance and I did it and I fell in love with oil painting. I mean, <laughs> it's 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 most of what I work with now. <laughs> and what is it about oils? Is it the, the kind of vibrancy of it, or yes, definitely the pigment. The pigment is so vibrant, and it's it's like no other medium, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but it's so smooth, and you can just build and build and build, and you can wipe away, and you can just. You can do so much with it. It it never dries hardly. I mean, it it dries eventually, but it's slow drying, so it's very forgiving, and I just I love it. <laughs> and so the the art therapy element of that too, I'm kind of fascinated by that. So as you're you know learning how to work with oil paint, really falling in love with it, you're also learning a lot about art therapy and a lot of you know a lot of what that world is like. And what was that? Um, where, where does that come into play, I guess, in the um, so obviously you have the artistic side of it, but then the kind of the, the therapy part of it is a is, is sort of a, a key piece to it, but it's a little different to, you know, just just only pursuing painting. So how where did that come into play? Yeah. Um, so basically, I've always as soon as I've heard of art therapy, I, you know, I wanted to go into it. Um, I've always found like the human mind very interesting. Um and, you know, I, I just knew that when I would paint, I would just go into this zone or this mode of kind of like the Zen mode where I would just be, um, you know, floating in space kind of. <laughs> and it was so the word I learned was cathartic. You know, it's it's a release of everything that you're thinking about. Um, yeah. And it, it led me to start my own business. Um, it's called Painphoria. Um, you know, it's a place where people can go to just free paint and they can splatter, um, all over the canvas and, um, yeah, they could take it home with them at the end. <laughs> so when you say that, it's like, I picture, you know, are, are you laying down like, like tarps, you know, to catch all that? Is that, it requires yes. a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> it requires a lot of preparation, but yeah, it's, it's a startup business. So it's fairly new and I'm still working out the bits and pieces of the business but yeah you lay down tarp and um, protective flooring and um, protective things for the walls and people can just come in and 
make a mess. Because <laughs> people think about that, I would imagine, like an artist being in their studio, basically doing that. Mm -hmm. So you've you've essentially done that. <laughs> you, you can attest to the positive mental health yes, aspects of that yes it's very very i mean there are days where i just you know i'm i'm going through a lot and i just want to decompress and you know i just go into my studio and i start painting even if it's not something i'm going to show at a, <laughs> at a <laughs> at a museum or, or a gallery but um sometimes i just do it for myself i even drawing any medium every medium honestly is 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 productive you know <laughs> right so it's not because th people talked a lot about this during COVID I remember mm -hmm. of like the creatives during COVID you know you don't feel guilty about okay you have you finally have this time now right that's like <laughs> the one thing that you never had before is yeah. dedicated time now we're all locked down you know hunkered down all you have to do is create write paint write songs whatever it is but some days you don't want to do it. You have nothing left to give. You shouldn't feel guilty, guilty about that, right? Right. I definitely agree with that. Never feel guilty about not creating. I, I saw this post on Instagram that said, you know, creatives are always creating or thinking about creating. That's still a part of the process. You know, you you get inspiration from everywhere. So, um, you know, nothing is not working. <laughs> In yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Even the not. Well, it's like yeah. It's like you. You know, rest is part of the larger yes. equation, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, uh, museums, galleries, exhibitions. You've had your work featured in a number of places locally. Um, one of the ones I think. Um, well, actually, one one of the things I really wanted to ask you about was while you were at Buff State, um, you had this undergraduate summer research fellowship, right? Yes. Where you're, you you um, had eight portrait paintings that you did of influential individuals in the African American community. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and maybe which eight you chose and, and why? <laughs> yes, of course. Um, yeah, it was just a project. Um, it was a fellowship project. Um, I did research on these individuals. Um, four of the portraits were of people who I felt were victimized and, um, you know, the other half were people who I felt mostly local, but who I felt were worthy of celebration. You know, their name doesn't get, um, you know, celebrated enough. So, um, yeah, the, the people were, I believe I did Brianna Taylor, um, George Floyd, Daniel Prude from Rochester, and I believe I did Carrie Carrie Horn, um, and, um, you know, this is in 2021. So, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter um, protests were really big. They were, it was still big, you know. Um, so I just wanted to speak to that time, you know, honor some local people, local heroes. And, um, yeah, the other four, I believe, were um, Congresswoman people, Crystal People Stokes and... Um, at the time, she was president of Buffalo State, uh, President Catherine Conway Turner, and, oh, man. I know, I put you on the spot to I name know. all eight. Sorry about that, yeah. um, who else did I do? Um, David Driscoll, he's a curator um, who passed away in 2020, I believe, and um, one more. I always miss someone. <laughs> That's okay. That's, again, <laughs> but so so it's interesting because yeah, in order to think through, so that was the the idea from the beginning was it was always eight, and so then it was up to you to kind of figure out who that eight was going to be. Um. Yes. <laughs> it was. It was a lot during that time. My father passed away during that time, oh, wow. so. Um, I initially wanted to do 10, <laughs> but I decided, you know, with everything that was going on, I would do eight and I still wanted to do it. I didn't want to just, you know, not do the project at all. Sure. Um, and it was a really pro it was a, it was an amazing process for me. I learned more about me as an artist and, you know, my drive. Um, I just learned a lot and not only from the research portion of the project where I had to like really look into their lives. Um, you know, it, it, it was, just, it was amazing. I was so proud of myself at the end of it, but, um, you know, I was just so happy I could, you know, do something to honor those people because they deserve it. And, <laughs> and this is sort of a thing that always fascinates me in terms of the creative process. So you talk about that research phase when you're researching these different people's lives does what you learn during that point influence the way that you end up kind of representing them? I mean, even if 
maybe you don't know, but maybe you look at the finished work and there's a certain aspect that you read about in their life that, oh, I really wanted to maybe draw attention to this or, or focus on this in the art. Yeah, for sure. Um, sometimes it's, you know, I'm not conscious of it when I'm actually painting, but then I realize like, oh, okay. So I drew this person in this area because, you know, of the urban, like for example, Carrie O'Horn, I drew her, um, I painted her with um, a brick wall on the back. And I was like, wow, that, that she does a lot of street work, like where she, where she's, you know, working um, for the community, for the people. Um, and then this other one, I, sometimes I selectively choose the background where, for example, a portrait with Daniel Prude, um, a man from Rochester. Um, um, I painted a portrait of him and it was, it was from a video, it was from a photo that I found of him and his mother's, um, kitchen. So I decided to incorporate that. That's the place where he, unfortunately uh passed away so you know sometimes it is intentional sometimes it's just <laughs> you know all in all in my head uh conscious subconscious so <laughs> and then like so you know i i was reading it's sort of to that point i was reading you know in your bio talking about incorporating bold color expressive brushwork specifically to provoke emotion so a mm-hmm. lot of that really comes through we talked about this before but working with with oil it's 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 vibrant it's i mean is is there do you want your your pieces to be conversation starters is that kind of the goal 100 percent. that's always my goal is to start a conversation no matter what the conversation um you know any conversation is good conversation um i'm really big into you know being a catalyst for change and that's the only way you can do that is you know by talking about it um yeah, for sure. I would say being relatable to people's experiences, um, specifically those who are marginalized as a black woman. Um, my perspective is always going to be from the lens of a black woman. <laughs> it's just it's just how I choose to, you know, how I choose to tell how to use my voice, how I choose to use my voice. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and so, you know, you you've also painted Fred Hampton. You mm-hmm. have a, that available on your website. Yes. Um, are there different considerations given to approaching somebody like that who's, you know, this historical figure long since passed, but a historical figure um, that's more widely known versus someone more local like Carol Horn or somebody? Are there do you think about the subjects a little differently? Do you approach the work a little differently? I try to re- Uh, approach it consistently so even though people may not know this person or they may know this person I try to keep it consistent they're all people at the end of the day I really try to speak to the humanity of each person you're not just a figure you're not just the the movement that you are a part of you're a human being and I try my best to you know illustrate that in all of my work yeah um so some of your work, I hope you're okay with this, but there's a couple of your work specifically that I kind of wanted to get into. So mm-hmm. the first one, um, There Goes the Neighborhood, mm-hmm. which was featured at Birchfield Penny last year, I believe, in yes. one of their exhibitions. Mm-hmm. Can you, well, for, I'm, so radio, right? But can you maybe explain a little bit of what that looks like, what's happening, and then maybe talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, of course. So it's it's called There Goes the Neighborhood. Um, it's a portrait of a f- black family in front of a uh, nice very nice wealthy looking house um luxurious looking house um they're on the lawn and there's uh i believe two pit bull dogs a man with a do-rag on his head and his perhaps wife we don't know (laughs) but a woman and their two kids um yeah i just wanted to i painted that out of frustration i kept hearing this phrase there goes the neighborhood you know and for those who don't know (laughs) you know that means you know when a group of certain people come into a neighborhood they will bring that neighborhood down the value of that neighborhood down and I kind of wanted to just you know address that that that's not true you know there goes the neighborhood but there it goes you know this is I wanted to show 
specifically black people that they can be wherever they envision themselves you know yeah yeah it, well it reminded me a little bit of uh um to pimp a butterfly yeah. the album cover from kendrick lamar it was just kind of a similar <laughs> a similar concept there's there's a a group of black people on the white house lawn and there's sort of this uh, kind of implication that like you know this is not what we typically see right and yes. and what might the reactions be of people mm-hmm. looking at this and what might that say about who's actually has a problem with this right <laughs> yes yes indeed i definitely want people to you know take a look if they feel offended you know really understand why you're feeling that way if you feel empowered understand why you're feeling empowered and you know that that's really important to me as an artist <laughs> And so, like, how how much of that uh, a- approach, I guess, uh, comes from studying painting at, at Buff State and, and some of the people that you get? Because obviously we think of the technical side, right, mm-hmm. and being able to kind of over, you know, the course of your four years there really hone that. Um, and especially remarkable if we're talking about really getting serious about it in 2018 to then only three years later doing this these eight pieces that are, you know, that's very <laughs> impressive. But h- how much of – how much of that education is technical and how much of it is really about the approach and how, like you just kind of mentioned. Yeah. Um, I would say, I would say it's more focused on the approach. I would definitely say, and I had to like my last year, I had to figure that on, on my own, the, the like narrative piece of being an artist and what do you want to say? Um, that was really, it, 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 you have to explore yourself. You have to, you know, n- look within yourself and look within the world and say, what do I want to say? Um, what really helped was research. <laughs> I mean, I was looking at every modern painter from different countries. Like, I, I just would study what are they saying and why are they doing it? What does the composition look like? Um, I would look up their interviews. I would look up just everything, the bios and, um, you know, that was a lot of, it was a lot of work, but it's worth it. You have to do that as an artist. Um, always be a student, <laughs> always learning. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So smeared is another one of your works. That I definitely want to talk about And this one. You actually, uh, a little behind the scenes action going on on Instagram <laughs> yeah. because you actually, if you go to your Instagram, you actually have a video of you basically painting this, yes. this painting smeared. So one of your most powerful images, I think, um, can you maybe describe that one? I think that the, the main sort of uh, image in it is a, a face, mm-hmm. but there's a lot that's kind of also happening in, in the in the work. And I was curious, can you maybe describe that one? Yeah, it's a large painting. It's about 60 by 40. It's it's almost as tall as me. <laughs> I think it's taller than me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's just a black man. He's the center um, of the piece. He's the, the subject. And basically he's screaming out um, and he is being, it's almost like, He's smeared. That's why I named it smeared. He's he's kind of being faded into the background. That's how I wanted to how I wanted it to be, you know, looked at as. Um, but yeah, he, he there's a background. It's kind of it's it's almost it resembles like old impressionistic um, landscape paintings. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's like rural. Yeah, very land. rural. And um, that's what I wanted. Um, um, yeah, I, I just, to talk more about the process, I I painted this large figure, <laughs> and I loved it so much. And I said, you know, I, I had this idea in mind. Um, it's kind of inspired by um, this painting um, from 1837, and it's a portrait of, a, like, an enslaved child um, that was uncovered. Um it was basically uncovered. It was an old like painting and um, somebody was restoring it and they were wiping down the, the layers of the painting and they found a black child. Wow. <laughs> um, and it was, it was, it happened to be an enslaved child. Um, and that's what the whole painting was inspired by, you know, um, just that erasure of history and stories and voices 
and um you know how that makes the person feel so I wanted to kind of speak to that little boy who was trapped under that painting for all those years um and 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 give him a little escape and bring it to everyone's attention and I mean that that one is the kind of thing based on the size and based on kind of what's in the foreground that's the kind of thing that someone does walk into a room and see it. Their eye, I think, would go there pretty immediately. So I would imagine people have told you similar things. Yes. Because <laughs> and, and that was on display, right, just recently? Yes. Um, that, one of the local galleries. Yeah, at Hall Walls Contemporary Art Center, yeah. <laughs> did you, And did you have some conversations with people about that, about Definitely. maybe the power of it? What, what are some of the – do people share, like, their – how it makes them feel? Do they share that with you? All the time. One person said that's – when I walked in and I saw that, I stopped, you know, in my tracks. And I was, wow. <laughs> and they were saying how powerful powerful it was and just how it made them think. It made them think about what it, what does it mean. And, you know, they wanted to know, like, what was my thought process. So that meant oh, so much to me. Um, meant so much to me as an artist. <laughs> and do you ever have any issue with uh, people asking about specifics i mean i'm here i'm asking you to do that but i mean do you you ever are there certain works that you'd rather not talk about and just kind of let them speak for themselves there is a lot of works that i so i (laughs) i always say i came to be a painter because i didn't want to talk i'm very (laughs) very timid and quiet and reserved and so you know a lot of people are like hey come on this interview you know i'm talking now (laughs) but um you know, I don't have a problem with it. it. It's just, you know, you some some things I feel like you have to talk about it. You know, you definitely have to have that conversation. But other works, like you kind of were saying, I just rather let it speak for itself, you know. <laughs> yeah. And that maybe there's something in there, too, about, you know, your choice of medium and choice of tools. Right. Like the fact that you do paint these very bold, vibrant things. It's kind of like, all right, now. I've said what I had to say. Yeah, <laughs> Let yes. the painting speak for itself. <laughs> yes, very loudly. Um, yeah, I uh, one also that I would love to you know in th- this one uh, on your website too is uh, "Sunshine on My Shoulder." Can you maybe talk about that one? It's just it's just one of the loveliest paintings I think I've seen. It's just there's Thank such you so much. It's just I don't know. It's a looks to be a, a father and daughter and daughter's young and there's a, you know sort of like the trim of what looks to be like a little child's room maybe in the <laughs> background so um that that was just one that i mean there's i think the title too like really evocative titles mm-hmm. i think can can influence how we receive the paintings but I, I i love that one in particular i thought that was very sweet thank you so much yeah that's a portrait of me and my dad um that was part of my first solo show at paint the town um yeah it was dealing with um, the grief and loss that I felt losing my dad in 2021. Um, you know, it was my graduating, it was my graduate show. So, Mm. um, yeah, it was my first solo show. (laughs) Um, my first actual show in Buffalo, like where people came out. Um, yeah, it's a portrait of me and my dad and I'm kind of like resting on his shoulder. Um, it's based off of a real photo that my mom took of us. Um, it was in my childhood home, my childhood bedroom, my nursery room. Mm. And um, yeah, I just think it speaks to me and my dad's relationship. We had a lot of fun. We would always laugh and talk and <laughs> all that stuff. Um, but yeah, Sunshine on My Shoulder, that, that title came out um he would always sing me that song. He would that was one of his favorite songs. Um and yeah, it's it's true. It's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> it really is. It's it it just represents me and my dad's relationship and I was so happy that I was able to display it. You were recently joined some other folks from the art world um at uh for a panel discussion at the Castellani Art Museum at Niagara University. So uh, I believe the topic was um, BIPOC perspectives and, and cultural representation. So, mm-hmm. you know, and we talked about this before, but you you sort of um, were sharing this and you wrote, you know, as an emerging artist, young person, I don't always feel qualified to sit at tables like this, um, but I'm learning that my perspective matters just as much as everybody else's. Mm-hmm. So that's I just think that's really that's an in, in, important insight, especially like kind of where you are in your career and trajectory as an artist. Um as part of that conversation, did you did you find that 
uh, the other folks at the table felt similarly or was that addressed or was that something I mean did, where were the those commonalities between you and some of the other artists that were um, yeah. uh, at, at that table yeah um, first of all they're all giants <laughs> um, they're just doing amazing work in Buffalo and I you know it was more so that I was honored to be on that panel with them you know all of them I respect so much um, we talked about it a little bit and they were like, you're more than qualified, Brie. Like, you know, this is, you have a voice, you should use it. Um, and it was very inspiring and, and it helped me learn. Yes. My voice is valuable. There's so much that I have. To, my perspective as a young person needs to be heard because, you know, a lot of young people don't feel comfortable enough to say what they have to say. They feel like people older than them, um, you know, no more mm -hmm. <laughs> or mm -hmm. you know maybe i'm not educated or i don't speak fluently enough or <laughs> um but I, I would really encourage anyone who's dealing with that just do it be scared a little bit you can mm -hmm. have a little anxiety about it but still do it anyway it's important <laughs> yeah and i mean right the only way that you get more comfortable doing it is by doing Do it right more. and by kind of trusting <laughs> that voice yeah Yes. Did you get? I, I, was was there some audience? Was there like an audience portion of that? Yes. I, now those okay, so those can kind of go either way, right? Like you're talking <laughs> yes. about a panel discussion, but I, so I'm curious, having not been there, um, did you find those were important questions or conversations or some of that interplay mm -hmm. and, and like what kinds of lessons? I guess maybe did you take away from that experience of being on that panel? Yeah. Um, the people in the audience, the, the question and um, answer section was really, <laughs> really great. They asked some great questions. It kind of stumped me a little bit uh, for a second. Really? You know, where you really have to think about the the answer of what you're going to say, <laughs> your response. Um, but it was it was really great. I'm I, you know, it was just. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Um yeah, well, there's, I mean, right, because there's always like, kind of to that point, for folks that are used to speaking, or they have a lot of these under their belt, so to speak, mm -hmm. they may get asked similar things over and over again, right? So they're kind of used to doing <laughs> yes. that. Somebody who's new, somebody who's sort of starting out and, and, you know, not necessarily finding your voice, but certainly finding your voice on a, you know, to be on a, a panel, mm -hmm. it, it does take a second to be like, ah, how, do, how do I feel about this, actually? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and as you said before, a sort of lifelong student, right? Yes. Yeah. It's very on the on the fly, you know, yeah. improv. Um, but, you know, if you're speaking genuinely with your answers and you, you know, don't be afraid to be genuine. Like, maybe I don't know this topic, but I'm hoping to learn more or, you know, just being honest with it, <laughs> you know, just telling answering the questions the best you can and mm -hmm. you know authentically i think it's 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 good it, it ended up good it was it was really awesome to hear everybody and i was most shocked because i was like oh these people actually want to hear what i have to say <laughs> <laughs> me little old me <laughs> so it was awesome yeah. so i've always been curious about this too in terms of like the life of an artist right like so especially a visual artist so are you painting every day no, okay. <laughs> there's there's no way I could possibly do that. <laughs> I wish I could. That's my that's my dream in life. That's aspirational <laughs> for you. Yes, but I do, I don't think that's realistic. But um, I try to schedule my day around certain hours. Like treat it like a nine to five. You mm. know, mm -hmm. from nine to five. You know, if you're if you're not in the studio, do something geared to preparing a work or thinking about a work or brainstorming or researching. Um, so I try to do that every single day. It's not perfect, <laughs> but uh, I try. <laughs> yeah. Um, how how much have you done commissions at this point? Um, I've done quite a few commissions. Okay. Um, local locally around Buffalo, I've done small commissions for you know people that I know, um, people that I don't know. Um, yeah. No, I don't really have any larger commissions other than my mural work. Um, you know from larger organizations i just did a mural well just did <laughs> i did a mural in the summer um with niagara falls um niagara falls underground railroad heritage center oh yeah yeah so you know that's a 
that's a commission, I guess. <laughs> and yeah. um, they commissioned me to do this mural. And um, I have quite a few, quite a few commissions around the area. <laughs> what was that mural at the Niagara Falls? So uh, yeah, center? it was a large mural. It's the largest mural I've ever done. Um, and basically it was, you know, the prompt was freedom um, because of the Underground Railroad and, you know, the history in Niagara, in Niagara Falls. Um, so I did one under the bridge. It's a large mural. It has a African-American woman figure with a cage over her head. Mm. It's kind of, <laughs> it's different than what I normally do. Mm -hmm. um, a little surreal, but... There are butterflies in that cage, and they're going free. And there's, um, they're kind of moving along the, the the skyline of Niagara Falls. So you see the Niagara Falls, and you know there's a couple who are on a canoe or a boat, and um, that's based off of a real couple who was who were escaped slaves, mm. and they were escaping to freedom. Um, going through Niagara Falls to go to Canada mm -hmm. for freedom. So um, I just wanted to pay homage to those two figures. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's where that research element comes into, yes. right? <laughs> yes, definitely. You have to do your research. It just makes it more impactful and more educational too. So some people don't know these stories, so you have to tell them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In, in that role that you're in. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK. So name of our show is what's next. So what's coming up next for Brie Gilliam? What's coming up next? I believe on March 22nd, I have um, a small painting that's going to be featured in um, Buffalo Art Studios Live on Five exhibition. So that's that's what's coming up, you know soon <laughs> that's coming up pretty soon you also yeah. mentioned there was was that the mural you were talking about or there's another mural display also possibly coming up yeah there's another mural display um it's going to be at um niagara falls boulevard um you know commerce center and um yeah i'm just gonna paint a, a spring theme mural <laughs> um so if you're in the neighborhood you can check that out and yeah <laughs> and then you know painting every day working up to that point but also making sure to you know if you just need to you know have like a splatter day right that's, yes it's a very important <laughs> lesson to take away from this conversation yes that's the most important <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but seriously yeah yeah just be free <laughs> be free with the paint <laughs> cool i like that well brie gilliam thank you so much for joining us here on what's next thank you so much for having me i, I really appreciate it it means a lot stay with us more What's Next to come here on WBFO. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at wbfo.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. This is What's Next on WBFO. Today we're joined by Tiffany Gaines, Curatorial and Digital Content Associate at the Birchfield Penny Art Center. Tiffany, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Patrick. I'm so excited to be here. For sure, yeah. So I think we should say up front that um, there's some new collaborative work from you, from Julia Bottoms and Jill Jillian Hainsworth, um, that's going to be featured, or that is being featured at the Buffalo AKG Art Museum. It's called Before and After Again. We'll have a little bit more on that on WBFO in the coming weeks. I want to say that up front, but it is kind of fitting to mention it up front because I think uh, one of the big things that I kind of wanted to talk to you about is like, that that is a collaborative work. I'd like to devote kind of part of this conversation to talking about collaboration. And it seems like given your work, you know, curatorial, but also just kind of like being in the scene, a big part of that is having relationships with artists, kind of being aware of what's going on. So that feels very collaborative. So is that how how do you kind of describe the the Buffalo creative art scene um, in terms of that? I mean, do you, do you find it to be very collaborative? Oh, absolutely. Um, I worked on an exhibition with Julia Bottoms uh, last summer, and during a tour, somebody described Buffalo's scene, art scene, community in general, um, so poignantly that I'm going to steal it, and this is how I'm going to describe it anywhere I go. But I think Buffalo's art scene is like a living room. 
where like everyone kind of is in the space and, and knows everybody or is connected by one degree of separation. I think there's a level of proximity here where it's very easy to be connected and to find through lines with people that are exploring the same ideas as you or just looking to collaborate in similar ways and it's really exciting to be in a city where collaboration and that proximity between artists institutions collectors feels so um, intertwined and so it's really cool to kind of see how those connections reveal themselves through projects um, and and create opportunities to work with people that maybe I've met through other channels and you know I find that we have this common interest so I love Buffalo's arts seen as a living room that's kind of how I think about it um, for better or worse <laughs> yeah yeah and like that's pretty interesting perspective because you're not from Buffalo originally so you came here right did you come here for school yes, yes. and you stuck around so obviously there was yes. a lot to offer in yes. that way so I came to Buffalo in 2013 um, I went to Buffalo State go Bengals and um, when I graduated I actually started working at the Birchfield part-time um, at visitor services in the museum store and I kind of thought to myself, oh, I'll be here six months. I'm going to stay in Buffalo for a year and then go back home or go wherever, you know, to get my quote unquote big girl job. And now it'll be going on seven years that I've been at the Birchfield, um, 11 years that I've lived here in Buffalo. And so the way that I've been able to find a sense of home and community here is something that I never would have expected. Um, and, you know, when we had the talk um, at the AKG last week about before and after again and just kind of talking about the process, um, one question that I was asked was just kind of like what I learned from that experience. And it gave me an opportunity to kind of reflect on not just that project, but just how being in the arts community here in Buffalo, like what it's meant to me over these past few years and the thing that I really took from not just that experience, but my work overall is finding this sense of home um, and, and really coming into a space where Buffalo now feels like home. You know, I love New York City. I am a Brooklyn girl through and through. Like, I'll never leave that. But it always feels like I'm visiting when I go back to New York and when I go back to New York City. And then when I come back here, it feels like I'm coming back home. Mm. And so that's been really interesting how that sense of home has evolved and kind of changed for me over these past few years. And what is it that that do you have like a memory of when you maybe first started to feel like, yeah, in fact, maybe I will. Maybe this is feeling a lot like home to me. Maybe it's the, the art scene is feeling like a living room. I mean, or is it just kind of a gradual thing that you get a little bit cozier in as the years go by? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. I think it was gradual. Um but I would say really transitioning into working full time at the Birchfield. So I started um, curating and doing uh, digital content communications full time in January 2020. And that was two months before COVID. So oh, right, yeah. right before we went into shelter in place. And, and I think that's where I kind of started to feel that transition that like, OK, I could see myself here for a while. Um, I think I kind of once I got into that full time space, I stopped looking outside of Buffalo for what's next. Mm. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And, and as I kind of grew in my um, curatorial work, you know, from that um, time from January 2020 until now, just the way that I have been so welcomed by the arts community, by the black community, the black arts community in particular, mm -hmm. through a lot of my projects, I really started to feel this sense of community, but also the sense of trust, you know, in telling stories that are historic, that are very deeply personal, um, in connecting with more artists and working on more, more exhibitions, I really felt this sense of trust and welcoming in the community that I feel very honored to have received, um, and I take it as a responsibility. And so I carry that through my work of how can I do my due diligence to honor the histories and the stories that maybe I wasn't here to witness, but I'm here now to share through my own sort of voice and my own lens as, as someone who came to this space as an outsider, but has really made a, a home here for myself. Yeah. And because part of the stated mission, right, of the Birchfield Penny is like amplifying the mm -hmm. voices of regional yes. artists. Yep. too. So, yep. We're all dedicated to West New York artists. And so that I think added to that sense of finding home just because 
our work, our mission is so grounded in the communities that we serve, you know, and just, again, that proximity of artists that I've worked with are people that, like, I would see, like, in the grocery store Mm. or people that I've just met, like, on the bus or, you know, just out and about. And so being able to kind of work with them in that art space and and really draw attention to them um, in the museum world as well, it's been really special to be a part of. And just maybe we could pull back the curtain a little bit and you can talk a little bit about what that work looks like, right? Because a lot of it is, I would imagine there's outreach, community Mm -hmm. outreach element, Mm -hmm. but getting to know artists Mm -hmm. really well, Mm -hmm. getting to know their work, but then also developing these relationships Mm -hmm. with them Mm -hmm. so that way they feel there's a sense of trust in in translating the work or staging the work, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's a combination too because, you know, at the Birchfield, we work with artists um, and tell the stories of artists, both historic and contemporary. So, Part of it is building those connections with contemporary artists, with finding, you know, emerging talent, with, you know, staying um, up to date on what's happening here currently. But then also this idea of connecting with the elders in the community to learn about the histories of black art in Buffalo of the 60s and Mm. the 70s. And, And a lot of these stories, you know, are at risk of being lost because so much of it is preserved through memories, through oral tradition. Um, you know, when I worked on in 2021, I curated uh, the exhibition Founders, which explored the early history of the Langston Hughes Center for the Visual and Performing Arts, which was an inner city art center uh, downtown in Buffalo, founded by five black artists. And before that exhibition, there had been no written record of how it came to be. Mm. It really existed in the archives of the news coverage of the time. It existed in the records uh, from the artist founders that, you know, are in their homes, in their basements. Um, It existed in the memories of people that spent time there, the generations of artists that um, would go there to attend classes. And so to be able to kind of put a a chronological sort of um, history of that founding and how it came to be so that it would be remembered um, you know, and stand the test of time, that really felt significantly special. And, and lucky enough, I was able to work with uh, Jim Pappas, who uh, was the visionary behind the center um, and who has done so many incredible things in the community over the course of, you know, his lifetime. And, and just to be able to have that conversation, build that connection with him, um, felt very fortunate that he's still here to be able to share that. And so I've kind of wanted to use my work to preserve those stories so that they live on beyond this generation, beyond, you know, his lifetime, but can be remembered and, and celebrated um, in the years to come. And that plays into this fellowship that I definitely wanted to talk about. So, yes. okay, full name. Last year, <laughs> you were named one of the fellows in the Emily Hall Tremaine Journalism Fellowship for Curators, which is through Hyperallergic, which is a content publication, or like a culture publication, yes. arts and culture publication. Yes. Okay. So as part of that, your project that you're working on is called From the City, Exploring the Continuum of Buffalo's Black Art Scene. Yes. All the titles, all the names. You got it right. (laughs) So can you talk about that idea and maybe how you – I I guess this is something that you applied for in the fellowship. Okay, so you were selected, and you you applied with this idea in mind. This is the project that I want to do. Yes. And and what was that kind of like? I mean, because it sounds very in line with – if you look at, you know – the black art scene in Buffalo in particular, or any art scene, but as a continuum, that that mm-hmm. is very much in line with kind of what you just said. Yes. Um, and so the idea of applying for the fellowship um, really spawned from the work that I did on the Founders Exhibition um, and this idea of preserving the legacies of black artists here in Buffalo, but also more broadly. And this idea of, a, of it being a continuum really came through my conversations with Jim Pappas. Um, So again, he was the visionary behind the Langston Hughes Center, um, was one of the co-founders, but also was an incredibly uh, well-recognized abstract expressionist painter, um, printmaker, uh, and photographer. Uh, He established, helped establish the Black Studies Department at the University at Buffalo. Uh, So was incredibly uh, involved in utilizing art for social change uh, in the late 60s and early 70s and even beyond that. 
Um, and one series that he has worked on visually in his work, it's uh, actually two, Inner Space Continuum and Outer Space Continuum. Mm. And so this idea of art as a continuum really came through my conversations with Jim. Um, if, if folks know him, he is just such a kind and gracious and, and uh, humble person. You know, he's done all of these amazing things in the community and has made all of this history. And when you ask him about it, he's like, well, you know, I just did what I felt was right. And mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. one artist in this continuation of artists who are trying to use their work to improve their community. And so that idea of, of being a part of a legacy that, you know, both precedes and, and follows after his time in it really made me think about this history that I was exploring as a continuum. Um, how does the work that he did and so many others with institutions like the African American Cultural Center, the Center for Positive Thought, um, the Black Dance Workshop, all of these places that I was learning about in the in the late 60s and 70s, how did they set a blueprint for the continuation in the 80s and the 90s and, and, and saw this evolution of how art has been used to inspire communities and to build a sense of camaraderie um, and, and self-actualization across the city? How does that continue in this contemporary space where we're seeing, you know, people like Idris and Alexa, Alexa Wajed making so many strides, um, like Julia Bottoms, John Baker, all these people, um, how does their work build upon the work that was done in the generations before them. And so when this opportunity came up, I thought it was a good space uh, to really think about how exhibitions that I've worked on over the last few years really contribute to this idea of this continuum of art as a, a means of change, as a way of seeing ourselves reflected, of finding ourselves. And so, you know, I could go on and on about it, um, but I thought having the space to write about it and really put it in some sort of chronology or make sense of what I was feeling um, would be a wonderful opportunity and, and would really bring attention to um, black art in Buffalo in a way, in a broader sort of sense that I haven't quite seen before. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to thank Scott Propriac, our director, for sending the uh, application my way because mm -hmm. I probably never would have run into it. Um, and then, you know, for them to have really enjoyed the proposal and just this idea of exploring this uh, community a little bit more deeply through my research, it all kind of just fell into place and felt very aligned. And, and without, you know, asking for too many specifics and give a lot of it away, because I know that as part of this, there will be an online exhibition, right, where a lot mm -hmm. of this will be mm -hmm. presented. And so yeah. without, you know, trying to steal too much of that thunder, <laughs> maybe to talk generally, wh what are you kind of seeing and in, in what does that research reveal about the way that more contemporary artists work either builds on or maybe just in a general way is in conversation with previous artists in Buffalo? You know, everyone says that Buffalo is in the middle of this cultural renaissance, right? Like we're seeing this newfound attention being given to arts and um, the cultural sector, you know, and, and this newfound interest in what it means for our community. And what I'm finding is that that's always been there, mm -hmm. you know, and Buffalo has always been at in the middle of some of the greatest art movements that we think about, um, but maybe has not always been recognized as being a part of it. Um, and so, you know, really, and, and it goes b even before uh, the black arts and, and black power movements of the 60s and 70s that I'm kind of focusing on. It goes even before that, but just using that as a starting point, for me and my research, you know, you, you see or hear about these national movements of artists creating space for themselves, right? Creating space for their community to be able to enjoy art, to destigmatize the idea of art as being inaccessible or elitist or only for people, you know, um, this highbrow sort of exclusionary sort of place. Um, Buffalo has always been in the center of that. And artists have always created that space um, for themselves and for their communities. And, and I think that this research and just this journey that I've been on um, over the years has just opened my eyes to the way that this history has always been here and has inspired me to think about how we can make that history more accessible uh, so that people know that this this interest or just this, this connection uh, of art as a way to build community, how it's been embedded in the city for generations. When you mentioned earlier about, you know, seeing artists on the bus, for example, or just something like that, you know, I, I think 
that that's very interesting and fascinating because I think that speaks to and certainly your role, but this idea of like art in the community and as kind of being of the community Mm -hmm. and like yeah right it's like i sit next to somebody on the bus maybe that person's an artist maybe they're you know whatever the case may be there's a sort of collective view of it that can can possibly be at odds with maybe more like long-standing ways of thinking about Mm -hmm. art or Mm -hmm. i don't know curation as being Mm -hmm separate it, it it exists in this place exactly. in this museum in this yes. gallery or something exactly but it seems like you actually have these conversations on the bus or Absolutely. in other places and i think it's interesting too because you know i come from new york city obviously which is seen as the hub of art and culture and, and museums and blah 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 and i think you know i didn't have very many experiences in the museum world um because i was young and didn't really know what i wanted to do with my life but I remember going to like the Brooklyn Museum and seeing all of these incredible pieces of art, but always feeling such a distance from Mm -hmm. those artists or just that world, right? Like it felt like I would come into that space and I would experience it. And then once I left, I would just go on about my life, right? And so it's so interesting to see how it comes full circle being in a city like Buffalo now where I can come into that world, but... No longer do I feel like I'm separated from that world. When I leave the museum, I feel like it's embedded in my life. You know, I see people that I've worked with that I care for very deeply whose work is so incredible and significant and poignant. And I just run into them at the coffee shop (laughs) or I run into them um, grabbing dinner on Elmwood. And just that level of connection between art and life, I think it's really powerful and really changes the idea of the role that we see art playing Mm. in life and in our community um it's really special and it doesn't happen everywhere you know i think buffalo is very unique as sitting on this cusp of feeling like a big city in some ways Mm -hmm. but then also having that small city sort of proximity um where it is easy to be connected with the artists and the curators and the collectors in the scene. And it doesn't feel like there's this um, barrier. Right. And I think that of course there's still work to be done to make that space feel accessible for all communities Mm -hmm. and to feel equitable for communities that have historically been excluded from them. But I think that there's a level of, of space to have those conversations. And so that's what I try to do with my work and, and sort of destigmatize those barriers and, and that exclusion so that we see that all of our stories are much more closely intertwined than maybe we think on first on first glance. Yeah, you've been speaking about your work and, and particularly for this um, fellowship in this kind of way that is really celebratory of the scene. Do you h- how much are you sort of digging into those barriers as well as sort of the other piece of this, right? Whew, well, that would be its <laughs> own, like that would be its own book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and it goes, it, it ties back as well with um, the before and after again exhibition where it's like, you know, we want to talk about art and we want to talk about community and we want to talk about all of these things, but you can't have those conversations without considering the systemic issues that have made certain achievements feel difficult or harder to reach for certain communities, particularly communities of color and black communities. Um, I think it's important to not lose sight of the ways that racial disparity um, and, and systemic inequality have played a role in making art feel more accessible, right? Um, and so I think that's an important part to include in the conversation. I don't dive too much into it in um, the fellowship. I mean, obviously, I could go on and on, right. but, you know, we've got word counts. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but I think it's important to kind of be cognizant of that um, and to keep that in the conversation. So as we consider, you know, art being the city being in this cultural renaissance. OK, that's great. But how do we use that energy, that momentum to make sure that all the communities that make up Buffalo, all the communities of color that have not historically seen themselves in these big name institutions, how do we use this momentum to ensure that these spaces feel welcoming and equitable and uh, representational of all the communities that are a part of Buffalo? And so making sure that that's part of the conversation as well. And we should say March 19th. Yes. 
Tuesday at 6 p.m. Yes. There's a Zoom event, which yes. is free, where you'll be discussing this and I'm sure a lot more. So yes. how can people access that? Um, so if you go on Hyper Allergic and look up the Tremaine Fellowship tag, I feel like that would probably be the easiest way. Um, you'll see not just my articles, but the articles of the other fellows. But um, you'll be able to read the pieces that I've worked on as well as register for the Zoom webinar, um, which will be Tuesday, March 19th at 6 p.m. Um, I am also going to put them on my social media pages just so that it's a little bit easier for people to uh, access. Um, and so I hope people will register and, you know, join in on the conversation and ask questions. Um, I really hope ultimately that this project will expand um just Buffalo's incredible art history to a broader audience and, and to make people stop and, and really pay attention to all the incredible things that are happening here that we see because we're, we're here and so close to it, but others who are maybe outside of the city might not be aware of. All right, well, Tiffany Gaines, thank you so much for joining us here on What's Next. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you so much for, for everything. And I'm excited for people to read the articles and the exhibition and join the talk and continue to explore this continuum. This has been What's Next on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown, your NPR station.